This is a podcast for nice guys. How do you want to be remembered? Someone who sacrificed everything or a man who got what he wanted while positively influencing others along the way? Join us to learn how to lead from the bedroom to the boardroom from the only international coach for nice guys, your host, Ashley Cox. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a podcast for nice guys. Today, I have Paige Michelle. Paige is a global human potential expert, life and business strategist, investor, and mommy. She's also the queen mother at Undefined, a personal development empire focused on helping women, especially mothers, take immediate control of their mental, emotional, and physical, uh, emotional, physical, and financial destiny with online education resources, physical products, and in-depth interviews with leaders. Her insightful work has been featured in Forbes, The List, Nikki Swift, Fox, NBC, and more. People often say you don't meet Paige, you experience her, and that experience has resulted in 18 million created collectively between herself and her clients in the last three years alone. Paige uses human design and her education in trauma, neuroscience, psychology, and ministry. Yes, she is a minister and soon to be reverend to help her audience of 80,000 women across TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook with 18 million views in 2021 alone. Paige is the author of the best-selling book, The Patterns, and upcoming Be a Mother, Not a Martyr, and can write that book because of her amazing kids, Ford and Ruby. So Paige, thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm excited to have you on and to hear all of your thoughts about nice guys. I want to go ahead and dive in. What is your personal history with nice guys? My history with nice guys is that I've always friend zoned them. I love them, but I've always friend zoned them. Um, and I've always had a lot of issues with the bad guys, but either way, a man being nice to me or being too nice and a man being a bad guy has always ended badly. And I think that I, I think that I friend zone the nice guys because I find them more dangerous. And so keeping them at a distance in that way was for me about preservation. I have always found them to be way more harmful because it's insidious. The bad guys are just bad guys and you know it. And you can just tell from the jump that they're going to ruin you and they're going to hurt you and they're going to harm you. You know what I mean? And you know what you're getting into when you're like, yes, I'm going to hang out with this guy. I'm going to date this guy. And you have your own trauma and your own reasons for doing that. Right. But for me, the nice guys, I find them to be much more dangerous. So I would always put them in the friend zone. And that was always what felt safe to me. So they didn't get very far with me other than friendship. Most of my listeners think that being nice means that they're not dangerous. What do you mean by the nice guys are dangerous? The nice guys are dangerous because they're completely unaware of their emotional abuse and their manipulation because they think that they're just being nice, right? But they aren't really looking at why they're being nice and what the outcome of that being nice is, what they're really trying to get. I think it's the fact that they're so unaware of their manipulation. At least bad guys know that they're being bad and that they're being abusive. It's the ones that are being, that are nice, that obviously intentionally, consciously do not want to hurt women. They want to be closer to women. That's their conscious desire is to want to get closer and build connection and to have affection and respect. And I know that their conscious intentions are good, but unconsciously I know what's going on and they don't know what's going on, which makes them extremely dangerous because it's like a sneaky, sneaky thing. So 95% of our behavior is subconscious or yes. unconscious. So when these men are, are saying things or doing things consciously, they're thinking to themselves on one hand, I'm doing this because it's for her and I want to be connected and I want her to feel safe. And I don't want her to feel like I'm a bad guy or like I'm taking advantage mm -hmm. of her. I want her to feel good. And that's their way of doing it. But subconsciously there's more going on there. What do you think their subconscious mind or unconscious mind is trying to accomplish with the woman that they may not be consciously aware of? Because this may be news to every single listener yeah. or, most, or to most of them. So everybody's is going to be different just depending upon their childhood and, and the, their values and how they were grown up and the rules that they have and the inner representation and their moms and their dads, like everybody's motivation, every man's motivation is going to be different. But I find that when you're trying to be nice, you can't be nice and honest at the exact same time. And so you can be kind, 
you can be compassionate, you can be intentional, you can be thoughtful and be honest, but you can't be nice because everybody's definition of nice is different. So I find that when people are being nice or they're just a man, especially, it's just being nice and he's just saying what he needs to say and doing what he needs to do. What is that? What he's trying to manipulate an outcome. And okay, you want me to feel good? Why? Why do you want me to feel good? Oh, because I like you. You don't even know me. You barely know me. So why do you want me to feel good? So you feel good. So you can feel connected. So you can feel loved and affection and whatever it is that you're seeking to feel. But if you don't even know what that is, and that's like, that's your motivation and you don't even know what that is. And that's the literal driving force of your entire life. I think that is dangerous to not know what's like motivating your behavior is dangerous. Do you think bad guys have the same intention? It's just that they're aware of it. They're aware of it. Yeah. And they've uh, owned it and they accept it and they've leaned into it. And ultimately I know that bad guys and nice guys have almost the identical, the identical desire outcome, but they go about it completely differently. It's just complete different strategies for the exact same outcome manipulation. So they're using manipulation to get a need met. Yes. I mean, that's the truth. When we first started dating, he was being very nice. I was probably used to being a lot nicer than he was when we first started dating, but he was being nice. And I was like, you're being nice and I can't trust you. Wow. Like, I don't trust you're not being honest. You know what I mean? You're saying this to get me to think something, to do something because you want something. You don't want me to leave. You want me to stay. You want me to love you. You want me, whatever that is, you, you know, and those are all valid wants, but like, stop telling me you're nice. You're not fucking nice. You're manipulative. I want you to be honest. What did you want to hear from him? What he wanted and like what his thoughts were like, what do you want to eat? Where are we going to go? One thing that he still like struggles with is like when I'm going to do things with the kids and he doesn't want to go, you know what I mean? He doesn't want to do the thing. He was still doing it anyway. And I was like, I don't want somebody there that doesn't want to be there because you're going to be, I can feel you subconsciously miserable and you're just doing it, you know, for whatever reason. So you don't want to upset me, you know what I mean? Because you want, and you just want us to view you a certain way and that's so valid. And I don't want you there if you don't really want to be there. Like if you're motivated by avoiding a pain, which is me being upset, which is withholding love from you or whatever that is, I don't want it. I want you to be motivated by wanting to make memories with the kids or you want to get out and about because there are days where he does want to do that. That is his motivation. Those are the days that I want him there, but I need all the information. You know what I mean? Because what happens is he'll go, not him, just not just him, but like in general, a man will go and he'll do all these things. And then I won't like return the favor in the way that he thinks that I should, or I'm not happy that he's there, or I'm not like bowing down to him or whatever the thing is that they want. Like, you don't appreciate me. It's because I know you did it in a transactional energy. You don't want to be there. You did it because you want me to be, feel a certain way about you. So I'd rather you not go. And then you only genuinely go. So it's like that little examples of that, where again, his motivation is to like, keep me around and to make me happy which is like so valid and beautiful except for it's not really that it's to keep me around so I don't abandon him so what's the difference between a bad boy who's being honest and someone like Jesse for example who's being honest with you like in your body or in your mind what's the difference um because I guess bad boy is one step closer but not the ultimate goal and you love Jesse so he's Mm -hmm. closer he's much closer to the ultimate goal. It sounds like he's balanced out both. What's the difference between the bad boy who's honest and the genuine good guy who's honest? The bad boy who's honest is not trying to be different. If that makes sense. Like he's pretty, he's okay with where he's at. He's not trying to grow. Maybe he's not ready to do the work yet. Like he's just not ready to to go up another level. Whereas Jesse is very clear that he wants to be growing with me and he's very clear that he wants to be growing and he's very also very aware that I grow rapidly and so there's that like well I don't want you her to outgrow me you know what I mean so he's going to keep growing he's going to be working towards it whereas a bad guy is just like I can't do it I don't want to do it um like he's being honest you know what I mean like but 
I feel like nice guys are just like, I am doing it. I am doing everything you want. This is all for you. And you know what I mean? I, I want to be better. And I want to be, I, I, you told me you wanted this, so I did it. And da, da, da. it's like, yeah, you're pretending like it's for me, but it's, it's for you. I love like, that. Um, but you haven't fully admitted that it's for you. Like, I want it to be about you. I wanted Jesse to, it to be about Jesse. I want Jesse to grow because Jesse wants to grow. I love that. So the nice guy is primarily unconscious. Mm -hmm. The bad boy is conscious. Uh, he oh. knows, he knows. From, I, every bad guy I know knows they have an issue and they are very honest with, with, about it from the beginning. I find a lot of times they have problems with their mothers. Well, both the, bad, the bad boys, they both do, but in different ways. Mostly I have found in my experience, well, Jesse is mostly his mom too. So I think it presents, I think I, I've never met a man that is like overly nice, like a toxic nice. And then like a toxic bad guy that didn't have a mommy thing going on. Exactly. What I see the most in this, there are exceptions to the rule, but the nice guy has the perfectionistic, anxious, quote unquote, perfect mother. Mm -hmm. And the bad boy has um, a mother emotionally who really, absent, really hurt him. They're both mm -hmm. absent. They're actually both out. even the most emotionally guilt. absent and physically absent then. Yeah. There's something more visceral and physical about it. Like it's more blunt or blatant or out in the open. Whereas the nice guy's mom is more unconscious. It's, it's like, she's anxious and she's perfectionistic. She, maybe she's got like this helicopter thing going on and she thinks that she's a perfect mom or wants everyone else to think that. And so there's this disconnect between appearance versus reality. The bad boys, I think it's a little more obvious that the mm -hmm. mom it, there's something going on with the mom. And so he has some anger inside and carries that over to women. So both have material with their mother. And mm -hmm. then what you're saying, the ideal is, is, okay, I'm aware that I have stuff with my mom. I'm aware yep. that maybe even I have, I have stuff with my dad. I'm aware that I have insecurities. I have, for whatever reason, a need to manipulate and control situations, even if it means betraying myself. Yep. And the, ulti the ultimate goal is I want to be, or you want to be with a man who is willing to grow on his own accord because he wants to, he's yep. willing to, he's willing to look at that material and then continue to not just, he's going past, he's getting past what he wants. He's getting past what feels good for him in the yep. moment and good, good, specifically good for his trauma. Yep. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with wanting what you want and, no. state, and stating that, but it, you want it to come from a place of I'm secure. I know who I am. I, I can look at my baggage and my wounds straight in the face and, and own that. And then what do we do from there once that foundation is in place? And that's where I start to, where you start to grow with your partner. Mm -hmm. It's again, it's the, it's the honesty, it's the self-honesty and it's the honesty with your partner. And I guess it would be a, the vulnerability of, um, yeah, I feel insecure you don't have to talk about your feelings. Like men don't even like to talk about feelings. Like that came from a place of insecurity because I, you know what I mean? Just understanding, like, I think I'm, my thought process is that of insecure. Yeah. I was trying to get you to do that because I don't want you to leave and I want you to be happy. Of course, men want us to be happy. That's like what they want. It feels good to be around a woman that is happy. It's the over, it's the taking over of the responsibility of their happiness or trying to manipulate in a way to make them happy as opposed to just asking that woman, you know, what she wants to be happy or just observing when she's happy, what's happening. You know what I mean? And recreating that and just noticing what, how she treats herself. If you're with a healthy woman, and like really all you got to do is treat her how she treats her. Like, what are you going to buy her? What does she buy herself? You know, what does she do when she's alone? What, is, what are the things she likes to go out and do? But you deciding what is going to make her happy is to feed her this lie or to go out with her, you know, with the kids or whatever it's not fair. And it's a power grab. Again, it's just emotional manipulation. And again, nice guys are like, to me, scarier because they don't know they can be more abusive. Yeah, they can. And then they play the victim. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like I, but I did everything for her. Did, okay. Why did you do everything for her? You know what I mean? Like, what did she really need? Did you ever like, what did she really need? Maybe she just needed a partner that like wants to do the dishes. Not like you did them to manipulate her to make her happy. Maybe she wants you to find a way to get excited to contribute. Yeah. And were you yeah. authentic? The answer is probably no, because if you're betraying yourself and lying to her about- And she I, can feel that. Mm -hmm. Like, I always know when he's doing something to make me happy and I'm like, or just to get a reaction out of me. And I'm like, stop. 
I don't tell them to do it. I just don't give them the attention. And so like, if you're not getting any attention from your girlfriend, your wife or partner, it's because she feels like she doesn't want to feed the wolf. Yeah. Not going to give you more attention for the thing that's like, that's not what she wants. So she's not going to give you more attention for it. She doesn't, a healthy woman's not going to feed your mommy issues or give you what you're trying to get from your mommy subconsciously. Cause we all have that inner child. So the, all of a sudden the eight-year-old feels like he's going to get abandoned or going to be abandoned, or he feels insecure. feels like he's not good enough or has anxiety or whatever. He takes an action towards his partner to try to fill that void. And a healthy woman would be repelled by that. And yep. an unhealthy woman would probably take advantage of it. 100% she would, she would manipulate that. And so manipulation breeds manipulation. So if your partner is manip- is like, if you're with a manipulative woman and a toxic woman who you feel manipulated by, it's because you're, you're manipulating her as well. There's just like a baseline foundation for manipulation from the beginning. And as the man, in my opinion, you should be setting the foundation and the container for that. If you don't want manipulation, stop manipulating her and just be honest about what you want and where you're going and what your intentions are and be directing your communication. So he has definitely for sure grown in that, in that area. And like the minute he's being manipulative, he'll be like, oh, that was manipulative. I'm being manipulative. And this is actually what I want to do. And that's what I'm going to do. And then I'm like, okay, then I'm going to do this thing. If I don't want to do the thing that he's going to do, you know what I mean? It's not, there's not this codependency. So manipulation being like, I'm doing X to get Y and he checks checks himself on that and goes, oh, you know what? I could just state what I want and work through this with my partner versus trying to add an extra step to get what I want. Yeah. And it's just like this self-awareness. Sometimes he'll do things and he'll be like, I'm coping. He'll just know in the moment, you know what I mean? I'm coping, I'm feeling anxious or whatever. And he's like, I apologize for this behavior because I'm just coping. And then here's what I'm going to do to fix it. Here's what I'm going to do differently. I'm going to stop doing this or I'm going to do this less or, and he comes up with a plan, but it's never me. Like you need to stop doing this thing. I just share my feelings about the thing he's doing. This feels bad. This feels good. This I feel insecure when you do this. When this happens, I feel insecure or I feel I mean, when he was being inauthentic or things like that in the beginning, I feel turned off. What turns me on is when he is direct, like he knows what he wants in this moment, when he's direct, when he tells me what he wants and he tells me what we're going to do, when he just takes care of it. Like he'll just give me a water. Like you need to drink that. You haven't eaten. You need to eat. You need to eat. Or he just goes and does the thing. So he's anticipating my needs ahead of me. To me, that's what a man does. That's real provision, not his needs, right? So if you're so busy worried about getting your needs met by manipulating me emotionally, you're not at all able to consider I'm going to need gas in my car or just considering me at all, like being two, one or two steps ahead of me. There's so many times where I'm like, oh, I need to eat something. It's like, well, I already, that thing's already done. Or I got this thing at the store. He's already anticipating needs because he's watching what I'm doing and how I'm treating myself. That's attractive to me, the provision in that way. And what else turns me on? He is more concerned with my orgasm than he is ever concerned about his. That's like his priority. What's the difference between a man anticipating your needs and saying something like, you need to drink some water or here's some water and a man being controlling? Well, (laughs) There's definitely him trying to control me. Like, let's not get it twisted, but it's the energy of the control. He's trying to control the situation, but it's coming from a place of this is what is best for you. And you know that, and I'm a strong masculine and I know that that's what the masculine within us is meant to do is the little girl is, is thirsty. So she goes up, then your inner masculine goes and gets the water. Right. And so that's all he's doing. He's like, you need water. He doesn't tell me how much water to drink. He doesn't tell me when to drink it. He just sets it in front of me. He's like, you need to drink that, drink that. And it's, I'm always grateful because I have forgotten to drink the water. I'm dehydrated at that point. So I drink the, I have, it's not out of line for him to try and take command or control the things that I obviously am not doing, you know what I mean? Or I've gotten caught up. Like it's not a, he's not trying to control me. He's trying to um, take care of me. So a lot of men who are listening, they swing way the other way to the nice guy archetype because they saw a man be controlling or abusive. So I think they are trying to figure out this line. In their mind, the solution is, I think they're trying to do what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Like I did all the things. I took out the trash and I 
cooked dinner. Actually, I've, I know I've heard men say like, she never cooked. I always cooked. And then they're bitter, uh-huh. you know? So I, I really am, I'm wondering if they're able to delineate, like, so it sounds like you're saying it's the intention. I have to check my subconscious intention. Mm-hmm. Am I doing this out of insecurity to make this person love me? Or am I doing this be- because I I'm care secure? About, and I'm mm-hmm. secure and I care about this human. And it is a hundred percent that that's the difference is he's not taking out the trash because it's going to make me feel good. Right. He's, and it's going to make me feel good. And like, I'm going to then kiss his, like, just like bend the knee. You know what I mean? And I'm going to be so grateful and give, it's like a clean give the water, setting down the water. It's a clean give. It's like, this came from the, this pure, I just love you. And I think, and you need water or I got, I thought three steps ahead and I already took care of this thing, but he never expects anything in return. It goes back to the orgasm. He never expects one back. There's never this, like, he's not upset because it doesn't, it's not why he's doing it. It's doing it out of a pure love and secure give. Whereas I did all the cooking. Well, how do you even know that she wants your cooking? Maybe she wants, maybe she's the type of girl that really enjoys having dinner out. Whereas like maybe you, like what you could actually do for her is go make more money (laughs) or go hire a chef and she gets to spend that time with you. Who knows what she really needs? Half the time, women don't even really know what they need. So have you had that question? Like, why is she, is she giving appreciation for the thing that you're doing? Well, why not? Have you asked her? Like, just have an honest conversation. Like I, I've cooked dinner, but you don't, that doesn't seem to please you. That doesn't seem to be something that, that you care for. What, what can I do? Like, what, what do you need? Yeah. I could hear the guys saying, I can hear them all chiming in collectively saying, well, if I'm asking her what she needs and I'm meeting her needs and doing all these things, I could hear them saying, what if she takes advantage of me? What if she's still disrespectful? What if, what if, what if there it's vulnerable, this leadership yes. that you're describing is very vulnerable Yes, it is, and it's, it's scary for them. And they're worried about being taken advantage of. So what do you think they should be expecting in return? If it's a clean give, what does that they do wonder what is there? I don't know how there to exp- at all. You know, there is an exchange, but it's like I don't explain it other than because he's giving from a place of it's a clean give, right? I give from a place of clean giving, and it just feels like there's no expectation. So I don't feel like he's giving to me in order to get something. So then I give to him without expecting to get something. If that makes sense, like it just balances out because it's this interdependency versus this codependency. It's just like, well, I'm already secure in who I am. And I know that I'm going to go out and make money. And I know I'm going to go out and do this thing. Like that my career does this and I don't need it from him. Let's put it that way. So the water, the dishes, like the things he helps with around the house that would get done with or without him because I would pay somebody to do it. So I'm not like depending on Jesse to do it, but it's so nice that he does it, that I don't have to pay somebody and it's done. And I, I have all the space to be able to give back to him. It just removes all of this resistance, but I think it just comes from a place of security. I'm not giving to him and he's not giving to me from a place of have to, or should it's because I, it's because that's who he is, right? He is just a person that's going to make sure you're drinking and eating. I don't care who, if you were here, he would make sure you're drinking and it's just who he is. He would anticipate your needs. He has space to give because he's not looking to, to get a whole lot. But then there are times when he does. He's not perfect, but he's aware of it. He's so, like, I need attention right now and I'm going to get it. But at least he's naming it, which is also. Was, oh, yeah. Because it's like yeah. I said, what's not cute <laughs> is that when he's unaware and he's doing it to get attention and he's not. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just like, we, call, we have a word for it. Like, we call it Mojave. Which is just like dried up. Like I'm dried up. This is drying me up. I'm like Mojave. That's our code word for this behavior. Mojave. But there's this like top line awareness and conversation around it. It's not like these things that are underneath that are hidden. And that also means we're having a lot of uncomfortable conversations. A lot of them. Mm, Say more about that. Because a, ni- a lot of nice guys are very avoidant. They're avoiding yes. uncom- uncomfortable conversations, their own emotions and conflict. There's a lot of conversations we've had around he, like if he's having a feeling like he wants to go travel and he wants to do certain things and that doesn't align with what I want, you know, in this moment. 
it would be mo natural for most men to just avoid their needs or avoid the conversation and just like hope it goes away and da da da. But I can feel when he's doing that. So I like dig it out of him to now at this point, he just offers it up. So we'll have a conversation. And so sometimes breaking up is on the table during that conversation. It's one of the options. If you want this thing and I want this thing right now, what are we willing to do? You know, does this align with who I am and my values? Does this align with your values? And like, how can we make it a win-win for everybody? But there's also breaking up is going to be on that table. Taking time, being away from each other that's uncomfortable is going to be on the table. Um, things that make me feel insecure is going to be on the table. Everything's on the table. But we have to be able to have conversations around it. Yeah, there's like certain behaviors of his. I was like, I personally can't be around you. I want to feel like this. So my boundary is when you feel like this, it's perfectly valid and you're behaving this way. That's valid. I'm not going to be around. I'm going to go do something else. So if you want to be like this majority of the time, well, guess what? I'm not going to be around majority of the time. So you're both able to regulate your um, emotions. It sounds like in those conversations, you might have some uncomfortable material come up like abandonment wounds or everybody's got stuff, right? How do you navigate through those uncomfortable emotions? So what would you say to nice guys who really struggle with those conversations. They don't want breaking up to be on the table. They don't want divorce to be on the table because they're crippled by this fear of fear. Reje rejection or abandonment. How do they move through that in their body? Well, you first have to accept that every time you don't, you're rejecting and abandoning yourself. Either way, the rejection and abandonment is there. That pain of rejection and abandonment is there. Even if you're not naming it, it is a crippling fear, but it's the only way out of the pain. The only way out of the pain is the thing you're avoiding, but it's the only way out of the pain. And you have to look at why you don't want breaking up to be on the table. Why? Because of what you're afraid of. And you can just, you can really look, like obviously work with Ashley. She can teach you how to actually move through that fear, but to not look at it, to not, he was in so much pain, so much pain by not having the conversations the uncomfortable conversation is fleeting and it is so like short lived compared to what he was living through by not saying the things and by us not having the conversation. I actually think it causes health issues for men. It, who, well, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They go, they go so long without um, speaking up for themselves, saying what they want, saying what they need, being honest, having these uncomfortable conversations, feeling those uncomfortable emotions so what happens is they end up having a heart attack or mm -hmm. they get frequent migraines or they get ED or they pour themselves. Like the impotence, like that's gotta be it. I know that in my past experience, that was a really big one for the bad boys actually. So like I said, it flows either way, but since he's been doing that, like he's been communicating, it's only increased his ability to, to have more sex. It's only gotten him laid more, a hundred percent and better. Well, if you think about it, you're letting the energy flow, right? Mm -hmm. So when you're having those conversations, it might feel a little icky in the moment, but at least it's moving and it's moving out. It's moving in the right direction instead of inward and getting stuffed down and repressed and then coming out in a really unhealthy way, whether it's relationship issues or health issues or everything. that momentary discomfort of having the conversation, like I said, is nothing compared to the pain of holding on to it and not having the conversation or just letting it ride because I was married before and he would be like categorized as a nice guy and he was fucking miserable. And through his being miserable, he unintentionally was emotionally abusive and that caused more damage in our relationship than anything else. I would have rather him just have said the things that he was thinking in his head than behave the way that he behaved by not coming home or tiptoeing around things, or just not speaking to me, or speaking to me when he was angry, or whatever those things were, because he would definitely tell you that I was manipulative, and I was toxic, and oh my god, it would be a me thing, but I look back, and I'm like, no, it was a you thing, but it really was just both of us not knowing who we were, and not communicating, and him trying to be like a good guy, and me trying to be a good girl, and not rock the boat. I hear that a lot. It's always her. She's crazy. She's the narcissist. The guy is the victim. What are your thoughts on men who feel like that. Cause a lot of people who are listening to this, that's how they're feeling. It doesn't, I think that mean... those people really are avoiding looking at how avoidant they are and how manipulative they are. And I genuinely believe that all judgment is self-judgment. So if you're judging her for being a narcissist, then you get to look at all the ways that you are being completely self-focused, manipulating somebody, doing something to make somebody happy 
is because you want that person to feel happy because if they feel happy, then you get to feel happy. So ultimately you're doing it for yourself. You are self-focused and it's about how you feel and it's emotionally manipulative. It's narcissism. It's not empathy. Empathy is seeking to understand somebody. It's not taking on their pain and it's sure as hell not manipulating them. It's just saying, I'm seeking to understand this. I can understand why you would feel that way or explain to me why you would feel that way. I'm curious why you feel that way. Tell me more. It's listening and it's having a dialogue. That would be kind. That would be honest. No, being nice is manipulative and it's narcissistic. It's the same. First, you have to identify how you're feeling before you can even begin to have those conversations with other people about how they're feeling. A lot of these men are disconnected from their emotions. From their feelings, yeah. You don't even know how it's making you feel that you're in this relationship with her and how you're feeling in the moment. And I, I find when I get to the, like, I've always, when I've been really angry at somebody or really hurt by somebody, by the time I get to that, I ask myself, well, why? I realize I'm just angry at myself. Because I'm in a relationship with somebody that's treating me like shit and I knew I should have left a long time ago or I know that I'm I'm settling or I know that I betrayed a feeling in the beginning or whatever those things are, but like, I'm just angry with myself. And I want to go back to that subconscious material that everything you're saying, for example, if a guy is manipulating the situation to try to make the part, his partner happy, then that's essentially the, again, the little boy inside who's trying to make his mommy happy. Mm-hmm. And- this goes back to, it's a very primal experience of if my mom is good and my dad is good. So dad's out there protecting and providing and mom is attuned to my needs. And she's the one actually feeding me after dad brings it home and she's preparing it. And my needs are met and they're happy. I'm going to be good and I'm going to survive. So it's a survival thing for the little boy Mm -hmm. to make sure that his mom is good, especially. And we see this a lot. If the dad is checked out, the little boy does more emotional labor. The little boy spends more time trying to fill his father's shoes to make sure that the mom is good because he's actually very close to his mom. And that's the low hanging fruit is like, well, I can't control what dad's doing, but I can make sure I give mom what she needs. Mm. We're not putting shame or judgment around any of this. It's, it's human nature. It's primal. And we get to transition to something more conscious and go, she's an adult. I'm an adult. I'm not in my childhood anymore. And now I get to transition to operating from a place of authenticity, honesty, security, open communication, sitting with those uncomfortable feelings. And that's when I step into my power, when I'm able to face the things that scare me, the abandonment, the rejection, when I don't self-abandon, when I don't self-reject, so I accept myself, I'm there for myself. I honor my own feelings. Then I can do that for someone else. And then we start to move out of love instead of fear. And you'll be able to anticipate their actual needs. And yes, you can have conversations about women and about like, what do you need? But you guys are all very smart men. Like, I'm sure you actually know what she needs. Or you can have a conversation, obviously, and ask her. But I think once you're addressing your own emotions and your own feelings, you can, in conversation with her, hear what she needs, what she's asking for. But until you have resolved your own issues and fears of abandonment and your own issues with insecurity and you're like tapped into your needs, right? Like sometimes you just need a hug or sometimes you just need it. When you understand that you will be able to tap into what she needs because men are so emotionally sensitive and that's the point. There's, they were made to be emotional so they could tap in and actually be, provide the woman with what it is that she needs. And so if you're like, I don't know what she needs, but I'm doing all this, it's because you're not at all tapped into what she needs. I promise you baseline, every woman just needs somebody that's in it every day. And that is consistently in it every day. And is like consistently a partner every day, whether that be he's doing the work or how he's in, he's in rapport with your needs in some way, he's present in emotionally and physically. If you, that's the baseline, that's bare minimum, you will get the result that you are working so hard towards with your niceness. You're not getting it because you're not available really for her at all. I agree. And I want to say that's the baseline of the relationship, but not necessarily mm-hmm. the baseline for yourself. What that looks like is she's getting, and the relationship is getting the overflow and you spend time, for example, on a morning practice or whatever you need to do for you to make sure that your purpose is on point, your presence is on point, your mental is on point, your needs are met, et cetera. 
yep. and you're operating in the relationship from that place where you've already done all of those things for yourself first. You've already met your own needs first or advocated for your needs and said, this is what needs to happen. This is the structure you set everything up. And so yes, he's showing up and meeting her needs. And I can hear all my nice guys going, well, that's what I'm doing. You're not doing it for yourself first. And it's coming from a deficit. And so literally no matter what she does, it's not going to be enough. Even if she gave you like a loving form of appreciation, because you're at a deficit, it's still not going to be enough. And then that's going to build resentment for her. And she's going to be like, what? I gave, I told you, thank you. You won't even hear the thank you. You won't even be present to her way of, of reciprocating because you're in such a deficit. And you're in such a, I need, 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 need that you can't even see what she's giving back in return. You've got to be coming from a, like at least a baseline, right? And then a surplus. Um, Jesse would be a very, a, it, it would not work if he wasn't taking care of his self first and foremost. And any woman that's like somewhat healthy is going to be absolutely advocate for a man taking care of himself. If that means that he'll take care of her. Exactly. And she can feel when it's coming from a deficit and when it's needy versus he's filling up his own cup and also confronting his material. So if he's being avoidant in the relationship, he's definitely being avoidant with himself. If if he's avoiding conflict and difficult emotions within the relationship and doing surface level things to skirt around them and to try to make Mm -hmm. them go away, he's also doing that with himself. And he's not sitting in meditation or sitting in silence and going, man, I feel really afraid right now that I feel really afraid that my business is going to take a loss this month. And yeah. I'm going to sit with that material, sit with that fear or sit with the fear of maybe there's something activated from childhood for him or whatever. Some There's some sort of re- usually a relational issue mm-hmm. or money issue where he's got fear and he's avoiding sitting with that material and moving through it and facing yep. it and getting back to a place of empowerment. And he's mirroring that in his relationship by avoiding difficult topics in his relationship as well. And really she'll do that starts- too when you come from a deficit, right. And you're not pouring into yourself and then you approach her for sex or you approach her for something that you need. She's going to be able to feel that you're in a taking energy and she's all day giving, giving, giving to like kids and like she, she can feel that you're trying to take something from her. Right. And that's energetic. Like, even if you're giving something, she can still feel like you're giving it. So I'll sleep with you later. You're giving it. So I'll do this thing for you. I can fucking feel the taking energy and I am not here for that. Right. So it's because you're taking, if you're not getting, it's because you're taking. So she can feel that. And I was a big one in my marriage. Like I could feel that he was doing things just to get, or he would want to have sex. I'm like, you're going to take one more thing from me if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're taking care of yourself, you have a baseline and there's no taking energy. So what if she's doing the same thing? Mm. She's not pouring into her own cup and then she's trying to take from the guy. How should he respond in a way that might feel scary, but would be effective? I would say I, a man telling me what he's observing, you know what I mean? In my behavior, I can't speak for every woman, but if Jesse would be like, you, I, you're not taking care of yourself. And I would say really lovingly too, being loving about it and like it coming from a place of, I really care about you and I'm noticing this and I want to make sure that we're successful as a couple and that this works for both of us. And so let's talk about what's going on for you. Mm -hmm. Asking her, like you said earlier, open-ended questions to help her. I'm noticing something. I'm observing something. Are you open to feedback? Can we talk about it? And asking her open-ended questions is beautiful. Or even giving options like is it this is it that what do you need do you need this do you need that and not making her do the mental work of trying to figure out what she needs do you need a hug do you need a plan you know what I mean and let her decide what she needs and then you can give it to her it's really easy to meet people's needs when you when you just ask what they need (laughs) and if they're secure they won't take it personally whatever it is that's going on for her they know if Jesse was this way when I hadn't done the work and he was like constantly giving me what I needed and I was in a, I was being, you know, I don't, hadn't done my work. I would definitely be defensive. And I would be like, you think I'm not good enough? If you're coming from a place of like pure security and you're giving her water or you're doing this thing and she's meeting it defensive, that's her stuff. And you get to then say, I'm observing this. And can you tell me why you feel so defensive? Why do you feel like I'm trying to change you? Or I love the way that you are and you just seem to be in pain. And then if it spirals out, that's when boundaries come into play. If it spirals out, then you say, you know, I'm willing to have this conversation with you and I want to, 
but I want to do it in a respectful, loving way. And so we can connect. Let me know when you're ready for that. Other than that, we're not going to talk about it and I'm not going to engage. I want to go ahead and start to wrap up. Do you have any final thoughts for nice guys? No, that's just that we love you. We, I genuinely have loved every nice guy that I've known. I just wouldn't date them and I wouldn't give them what they wanted, which was to be with me or to make me happy. I didn't give them the opportunity to make me happy outside of a friendship. We love you. And being nice is not the strategy. You want to be kind and honest and direct. Exactly. We love you. And we want the authentic version of you. Like truly, like even the good, bad, and the ugly, I don't want a fake version. I want you. Love that. Well, thank you, Paige. This has been an incredible conversation. Thanks for joining us today. Where can people find you? The best place to go is to undefinedbydesign.com or you can find me on TikTok at I am Paige Michelle or Instagram at I am Paige Michelle. And then my link in my bio has everything you need to to get in contact. Okay, perfect. All right, thanks, Paige. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of a podcast for nice guys. For more nice guy tips, follow Ashley at Nice Guy Reform School on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. See you next time on a podcast for nice guys.